we sort of uh, we play a little word game with everyone. <laughs> a little word association. This will be fun. <laughs> I've been warned about this. I re it's getting around. <laughs> it's getting around, and you're prepared, I see. Okay. Oh gosh. <laughs> now I am scared. What one word pops into your head when I say Scott Morrison? Um, <laughs> that's a good question. <laughs> Uh, um, uh, what would you say about him? What one word springs to mind when I say Scott Morrison? Bulldozer. Genuine. Ideologue. Divisive. Determined. Full throttle. Stubborn. Decent. Slippery. <laughs> Look, I got, on for, I got on with him, so I don't want to be one of them. I'm sure you'll have many haters. I, I, I'm not one of them. Misunderstood. Patriot. Committed. Dedicated. Driven. Leader. Disappointing. He's a complex individual and I find it hard to summarise him in one word. Very controlling. Controller. Lucky. Smoke. I'll just read out a few about you. <laughs> it's quite a range. All human beings are complex. I'm no different. It was a difficult uh, operation to be part of, uh, sometimes, the Morrison government. There was a real agenda of command and control, and I would call that megalomania. together with my deputy Josh. It's a next generation team that's going to create an even stronger Australia. So Scott Morrison's Prime Minister, he's won the ballot. We're all wondering, okay, we've got an election within the next eight months. Are we all gonna get smashed or are we gonna come home and win it? And I gotta tell you, when I got back to my electorate, there was a lot of unrest. Australian people were just sick of Rudd to Gillard, Gillard to Rudd, Abbott to Turnbull, then Turnbull to Morrison. I think a decade of that had really kind of worn thin with the Australian people, and we were sensing that. We suffered a lot of blows over that period of time. We had ministers who decided they weren't running again. We had another member, um, a member for Chisholm who decided to go and sit with a crossbench and we had our share of, of uh, obstacles but um, we remained ever purposeful and focused on our task. I think we were all pretty pessimistic. It had been a very bruising few years for everybody but one of the great attributes of Scott Morrison was he, he believed we could win. He believed and he made us believe. And as he said at the time, there is a narrow pathway to victory. I'll lead and you follow. And we had nothing to lose. The Prime Minister has called the election for May 18. I'm just good old scum, mate. Shark supporter. Morrison's pedigree was as a campaign director, so he understood the power of messaging, he understood the discipline of messaging. If you have a go, you get a go. And he understood about repetition and breach. We believe your money is better off in your hands than the government's. And that campaign was, was perfectly executed. 
Um, but it was helped by Labor's poor campaign. What's your name? I'm Vicky Dominella. Hi, Vicky. How what is you? your name? Bill. Oh, Bill. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, polls are closing, the vote count is about to begin. The Liberal Party is probably doing better than it thought it was going to, and particularly in Queensland. We can't see an alternative to a Morrison government in the numbers we're seeing at the moment. It is obvious that Labor will not be able to form the next government. Scott Morrison's being praised by his party as a Liberal hero for pulling off a shock win for the Coalition. said a few things that night, but to understand what that meant is to understand a bit of mine and Jenny's backstory about Abby and Lily and for the 14 years we were unable to have children and here they were. I have to stop. That win was and will always remain Morrison's win. Because from the disunity that we had in our party room before he became leader, to the incredible way that he brought the team together, I've never seen that in all of my years in politics. Well, welcome back, everyone. I do think after that, too many people in the Morrison government decided that they'd won the election because they were geniuses, as opposed to the fact that we'd won the election because Labor threw it away. And it's quite a different um, result. And that lack of humility, I think, infected too many people in the Morrison government who believed that they could do no wrong. It is our job to govern humbly for this nation. Mm. We must burn for the Australian people every single day that we have this privilege. Certainly he had a very high level of authority as the Prime Minister and of course that can be a very good thing uh, but it can also be a dangerous thing. It all depends on whether you get the big judgments right or not. Fire crews on both sides of the country have been battling major blazes that burn dangerously close to properties. I remember very clearly it was before Christmas. I was having lunch with Petro Giorgio and Ted Bayou. Ted's sense of humour is quite weird. And Petros can be worse, and I never know whether they're trying to fix me up or something's really going on. Or... Petro said, oh, Morrison's taking a holiday to, to Hawaii. I said, Petro, you're not going to get me. Sorry, you're not going to get me. Ted says, yeah, well, he's hopped on a jet star. And I said, right, are you two, enough. Number one. Half of Australia's on fire, he wouldn't be going to Hawaii. Two, no Prime Minister of this country flies Jetstar. Doesn't happen. So cut the bullshit, boys. I've had enough. You've had your joke. Now let's get on with the show. And then Ted gets his phone, turns around and hands it over to me and says, look. Every year, when we can, Jen and I and the girls would go down to the south coast of New South Wales and we'd rent a place. But Narendra Modi had invited Jenny and I to have a, a state visit to, to India. So it meant I had to break the news to the girls that that meant we weren't going on holidays in January. 
Uh, so we looked for an opportunity to get a short break before Christmas. Everything was under control. Mike would be acting Prime Minister. I, I did say to him, um, you're not going to the south coast. Do you think, you know, we'd had had a few fires, but he, he, he'd booked the holiday. He said, no, I owe it to Jen and the girls, and I get that. But when you're the acting Prime Minister, you've got people flanking you. They've got uh, little walkie-talkies and, uh, you, know, you know, they've got big coats. So, you know, it's, 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 it's full-on stuff, as it needs to be. And so I asked the question of the Prime Minister's office. Well, what happens when the question occurs? You know, you're obviously the acting Prime Minister. And, uh, and the, the answer came back, well, do you have to do that? I said, well, yes, I do. I absolutely do. Uh, I, I think the, the thought was, well, maybe can you just, you know, faff around that? But I, no, I'm not that sort of person. You ask a direct question, you give the direct answer and you give a truthful answer. Prime Minister Scott Morrison is getting hammered tonight for quietly going on a holiday. Prime Minister's office is yet to confirm Mr Morrison's current whereabouts. Well, I mean, I thought it was strange that it looked as if there had been lies told to the gallery about where he was. I thought that was odd. Well, as, look, as Prime Minister, you don't blame your staff. Some of those issues just were clunky in their handling. Um, but, you know, people don't get everything right, so at the end of the day, I'm responsible for all that. He is, as he describes himself, a bulldozer. That's what he's like. And people like that, when they get into a leadership position, inevitably find themselves surrounded by people that tell them what they want to hear and are too scared to tell them what they really ought to be saying. I mean, if, if I'd said to Sally Cray, Lucy and I are going off to Hawaii for a holiday. She would have said, are you out of your mind? As relentless bushfires and heatwaves stretch throughout summer, photos have emerged of Australian tourists claiming to have bumped into Prime Minister Scott Morrison holidaying in Hawaii. If you're Prime Minister and you're on holidays and the country's burning, you get on a plane and come back. No ifs, buts or maybes. I, I was gobsmacked. Just thought, no judgment, no brains, no this, he's gone. Finished. While we were there, tragedy struck and it was devastating. Two volunteers were travelling in a convoy when their fire truck flipped, killing both men. This is a dreadful tragedy yeah, and it's just one of those dreadful, dreadful things that happens um, in a dangerous situation where people are trying to serve. The girls in Jen will, will, will stay on, but I, I know Australians, they'll be pleased I'm coming back, I'm sure, but um, they know that, uh, you know, I, I don't hold a hose, mate, and I, I don't sit in yeah. the control room. Uh, obviously he doesn't hold a hose, but that's not the language you should probably use when, you know, literally thousands of your countrymen and women are holding hoses. The mate on the end of it kind of, you know, has that tone of condescension, which isn't really helpful. His first task was to demonstrate both national leadership but also empathy with those Australians that were suffering. Um, and, uh, and I think that's where it fell down. Do you regret the I don't hold a hose mate remark at all? Well, yes, in terms of how it was taken. And it was, I think, it, everything that I was saying at the time was being weaponised. What I was saying is that there are people on the ground doing that work. Uh, you know, a, a Prime Minister, d d you know, unless they're Tony Abbott and actually part of a brigade, um, isn't involved in that work. And the point was that those people are doing the job. And so it was a poor choice of words, but equally it was manipulated and taken advantage of for political advantage. emergency services minister and so after Scott had got back from Hawaii uh, he wanted to get out in the field uh, and understand the gravity of what had happened and so um, Cabargo was was at the epicenter of it. He knew that he made a mistake in going to Hawaii and he sensed that there was there was public anger 
and he knew that he was going to get it because he was rattled before he got there. We pulled up at a, at a fire station on the way through and that obviously set the tone. A firefighter on that day didn't want to shake my hand. I understand that. He'd been through hell. Not everybody wants to do that. Plenty of others wanted to that day. <laughs> there was always, and the advances from my understanding were told, don't go near um, the recovery centre. Um, there, there's some pretty raw feelings out there. How come we only had four trucks to defend our town? No, you're, you're the the nah, you're an idiot, mate. When we got there, it, you know, it, it, it started to go south real quick. The young lady who Scott grabbed her hand, she just wanted to help her fellow Cabago residents. How are you? I'm only shaking your hand if you give more funding to our RSS. So many people have lost their homes. We need some help. We need more help. We understand that. Again, this was misrepresented. She said to me, I'll shake your hand if you're prepared to help. And I said, I'm prepared to help. It's a war zone, and he walked away as I asked for help and that kind of broke my heart. That vision of him grabbing hands, I think he, he was pushing to try and get that connection too hard. But I wasn't close enough to Scott to give advice and we've never had a relationship like that and never will. It transcended into an ugly incident and he, he was whisked away and I went in another car and I just remember getting back to the airport uh, in Marimbula and he could sense what had just happened um, and, and he was shattered and Jenny was there with him and, and that was probably a good thing that Jenny was there with him to console him because he understood the gravity of, of what had just happened and what had played out on effectively national TV nearly live. What I had experienced in those places was devastating. Not about me, it was about what I saw. It's about the people I spoke to and it, it, it impacts you. Uh, you know, after copying it for being away in Hawaii and now, now this, that was the seminal moment that brought it all together for the Australian people. We had been in constant emergency management mode and had been since September with the fires. And then my health advisor came in and said, the chief medical officer needs to see you. You always take that meeting. And told me about a virus that we didn't know really much about, something out of China in Wuhan. It just changed absolutely everything. The coronavirus is top of the agenda for today's COAC meeting of state and territory leaders in Sydney. Under our federation, all the health powers sit at a state level. So it was very clear to me from very early on that this was going to involve an enormous amount of working together with the states and territories. It's great to be here in the heart of Sydney in Parramatta and uh, today all the state and territory leaders coming together. I don't think there was anywhere near the urgency within the federal government that there needed to be. They didn't quite get it that this was going to be a crisis like no other. But they got with the program pretty quick. Obviously our key focus today is working together as always to address the health needs of the nation. Just after lunch I get a little note which says the chief medical officers are, are, are calling, including Brenda Murphy, f to take far more extreme measures in terms of shutdowns. Now, this, this was completely at odds with what we'd been told only hours before. I cleared the room of everybody other than the leaders and, and myself. 
He said, this new report says this thing is far more serious than we ever, ever contemplated. I propose we form a national cabinet. What we've resolved to do is to form a national cabinet to deal with the national response to the coronavirus. To have a national cabinet where we could all work together, uh, it actually seemed a very logical thing and everybody uh, jumped on board and welcomed it. We will be advising against uh, organised, uh, non-essential gatherings of persons of 500 people or greater uh, from Monday. I'd said during the week that I was going to the football that weekend. <laughs> well, well, I do still plan to go to the football on, on Saturday, as I said, because um, this is... A... Anyway, I copped a bit of flack for that, and by, I think, the end of that, day, that night, I'd said I wasn't going. Whatever. From the very beginning, we made it incredibly clear, crystal clear, that all of us together would follow health advice. If we're all in this together, then that'll make it easier. No one's taking pot shots, no one's seeking political advantage. And then, of course, it unfolded a little bit differently to that. PM said, look, um, as a contingency, uh, I'm likely to get myself sworn in in case anything happens to you, because the presumption was that anybody at any time could get this disease and be incapacitated. On health, that was dealt with with Greg. It was even discussed at NSC. So, and the reason for that was we had the Biosecurity Act operating, which had enormous powers, unprecedented, in the hands of one individual. <laughs> so these were frightening powers, and I wanted safeguards around me. was staring into an economic abyss. Treasury in Australia had come to me and said, Treasurer, the unemployment rate in Australia could reach as high as 15%. That would see more than 2 million Australians unemployed. I mean, social unrest was in the back of all of our minds in a crisis. No one knew where this was going to play out. And Josh and I, in particular, and Matthias, knew that we had to get these economic interventions right. On the weekend before we announced JobKeeper, I was walking around Parliament House and I rang John Howard. And I said, John, we're about to announce an economy-wide wage subsidy with an eye-watering cost. I'd never thought that as a Liberal Treasurer, I'd be announcing such a policy. Josh said, look, we've got to object this enormous amount of money so it'll send us way into debt, and I said, you don't have any alternative. He said, Josh, at times of national crises, there are no ideological constraints. And for me, that was a critical judgment from Australia's second longest serving prime minister that we were on the right track. in place on, on finance delegations in, enabled billions of expenditure in the hands of one individual. So I didn't think it was appropriate for one person to hold those powers in those circumstances. There was an omission in, in, with Matthias, but I, that was a, a genuine omission and one that I was unaware of. We have already boosted the job seeker payment for those who have lost their jobs. Today, we are introducing a $1,500 per fortnight job keeper payment to keep Australians in their jobs even when the work may dry up. We're spending a lot more money than most Liberals were comfortable with. We were restricting people's rights much more, more than most of us were comfortable with and that did cause real tensions in the government. 
the money that was being shoveled out the door was just eye-watering. You had casual workers paid more than they were in ordinary life. Why on earth did we pay the unemployed even more? We came up with policies quickly that really had a significant effect in stemming the losses. JobKeeper saved more than 700,000 jobs. That sort of first three months, it was a period where people saw the best of politics. They saw cooperation. They saw leadership. And so he recovered those losses that occurred after the um, bushfires and his Hawaii uh, excursion. His net satisfaction just went through the roof. And I thought that will be a problem too because that will lead him to believe that he's unassailable. While we were dealing with COVID, there was always the question of its origins. Now, we all know where it started. It started in Wuhan. How it started, who knows? I believe that the World Health Organization should have the authority to go and find out what happened because none of us wanted to see this happen again. And Maurice was the first to articulate it. The issues around the coronavirus are issues for independent review and I think it is important that we do that. In fact, Australia will absolutely insist on that. To be able to say uh, around the World, World Health Assembly table that uh, it was appropriate to have an inquiry into the origins, uh, before the origins are so far in the past uh, that they're no longer discernible, uh, was something that we felt was important. Ultimately, we received almost unanimous support for that at the World Health Assembly table. Chinese state media is intensifying its attacks on the Australian government following the passage of the World Health Assembly motion for an investigation into the pandemic. The Chinese government went into free-for-all. They took that as a, a great offence, which I think is outrageous. News just in, and China will impose an 80% tariff on Australian barley imports. Beijing's decision overnight effectively blocks a billion dollar market. Our values aren't up for trade, our democracy is not up for trade, and our sovereignty is not up for trade. A really big part of the Chinese culture is a thing of face. And part of face is, is respect. And for a tiny little country to be pointing at China to say, you know, you need to do this, you need to do this, is totally incorrect. I mean, people were dying all around the world and they were worried about face. Give me a break. Medicare social safety net, all of those things. How do you think we pay for those things if you've got a toxic relationship with the, the, the place that buys more of our stuff than anyone else? I think always domestic political advantage was, uh, was a very big consideration that you'll somehow get more votes for that. Uh, and I think farmers and businesses and our whole country has suffered uh, because of that. We're seeing some very big clusters growing in aged care in very vulnerable populations and that is of concern. New South Wales and Victoria will be shutting down their borders uh, from midnight tomorrow night. Unless you are returning home to Queensland or you are coming to Queensland for an essential purpose, then the border is closed to you. I remember it was around September 2020 and the Prime Minister called me. The call was about uh, a young woman um, being allowed to come into Queensland and uh, go to uh, a funeral. I appealed to her on this occasion to provide an exemption for this young woman to be able to attend that funeral. And she said, I can't. I told him I did not have the powers to do that. And I said, well, you can. Um, oh, the chief health officer says this and I have to do what she says. Well, no, you don't. You're the premier. She works for you. He said, this will break you. Um, you need to do this. You must approve this. 
and it was, uh, it was, it was threatening language. I felt extremely threatened. I made no threat about it. I, I, I was, I was speaking to you, spoke to her like I'm speaking to you now. I said to him, look, if you go down this path, I believe that there could be death threats that would come from this. Uh, to which he replied, I get death threats all the time. Premier Palaszczuk told me, quote, it was brutal, it was disrespectful, it was threatening, unquote. What's your response to that version of events? Oh, I don't accept it at all. I don't accept it at all. Um, at, at the end of the day, the Queensland Premier proved in, in the sort of, I'd call it the second or third phase of National Cabinet to be the most political. I actually hung up. Um, it's the first time I've ever done that. And it stuck with me and has had a firm impression on me. And I think it also expresses the way in which um, he may treat women. As Secretary of Prime Minister and Cabinet, I'd always seen somebody who was domineering, um, whose relationship with the female members of his Cabinet left a lot to be desired. I just don't think he ever really valued women's perspectives. Look, from my, my perspective, um, his Pentecostal beliefs and his strict religious beliefs were certainly overlaid on his attitude towards women. He has a, a really weak, if no regard, particularly bizarre um, for working women with children. Um, you know, and I witnessed and observed and heard that from women who had worked with him a lot more and a lot more closely than I had. Um, so women who had challenged him or who weren't going to stay silent, such as, such as myself, um, we left. Do you think you have a problem with women? I, I don't. And my professional record of how, where I've worked and how I've worked over my entire life, I, I don't think indicates that at all. Prime Minister Morrison uh, chaired a cabinet which had the largest number of women sitting around the table in Australian history. I don't think that was uh, the credit was given where credit was due. I genuinely don't think he had an issue with women. He did surround himself by men. That was Alex Hawke. Stuart, Robert and Ben Morton. Now, it's not clear to me which women, if any, he listened to. I mean, clearly his wife, fine, but in terms of parliamentary um, colleagues, um, the, the closest were all male. If Scott Morrison had included more women or any women in his inner circle, I believe that would have affected every single decision that was made. Australia Post Chief Executive Christine Holgate will be forced to stand aside after the federal government ordered an investigation into the purchase of $12,000 worth of luxury watches for senior executives. And if the Chief Executive wishes to stand aside, well not wishes to stand aside, she's been instructed to stand aside, and if she doesn't wish to do that, Mr Speaker, she can go. I had a lot of concerns uh, about how that was handled. Um, Christine Holgate had not breached any policy of her organisation, uh, but had been effectively sacked on the floor of Parliament by the Prime Minister. All I was seeking to have happen is for the Chief Executive to stand aside while Australia Post did an investigation into this and brought back their findings. And my view was, well, I think my request is quite reasonable. And if she's not prepared to accept that, well, she can go. Now, I said that with a bit more uh, force in the parliament and probably could have taken a glass of water beforehand. I think it's one of the worst acts of bullying I've ever witnessed. It is an utter disgrace. It was ridiculous, you know. When you don't go into a public forum and berate another person. That is a conversation on the phone with them, not in the chamber, not, you know, because that's starting looking too presidential. You're looking too, you know, I'm the you know, boss here and, and, and people find it threatening. 
You know, they don't like it. It was a difficult time for the government. We had a number of issues or scandals hit us. Tonight on Four Corners, we go inside the Canberra bubble. There was the ABC documentary which aired allegations against senior cabinet ministers. And then Brittany Higgins's allegations of sexual assault within the parliament. Federal parliament has been rocked by claims that a female staff member was raped by a colleague inside a minister's office. Bruce Lemon denies sexually assaulting Brittany Higgins at Parliament House in 2019. When I saw the interview with Brittany Higgins, it was just... It was sort of like my head had exploded. The minister clearly didn't want to hear about it anymore. She didn't broadly want to see me anymore. It was, it was dismissed. It was played down. And it, it was made to feel like it was my problem. Brittany Higgins had said that she didn't feel supported by either myself or my chief of staff at the time. Uh, that didn't accord with my recollection of what happened, but I was deeply sorry that she felt that way. A lot's been made of you describing Brittany Higgins as a lying cow. Um, I did utter, you know, those words but it was about what was being said about Fiona and myself and what happened subsequently. It was never, ever about whether I believed or disbelieved her. Never. Jenny and I spoke last night and she said to me, you have to think about this as a father first. What would you want to happen if it were our girls? Jenny has a way of clarifying things, always has. Do you understand why many women found that statement a, a little concerning? Or... I, I didn't at the time. I, I was quite puzzled by it. And I actually regret saying it because, frankly, probably I should never have disclosed what Jenny and I talk about. And I, you know, I didn't want to bring Jenny into that. I was just, it was a very vulnerable and raw moment. Well, you know, he definitely could have chosen his language better because the reaction from the electorate was enormous. People were just like, goodness, you know, I would never say that. So, again, it was very clumsily articulated. But I think his intention was to say, you know, I'm talking about this to people I care about and whose advice I seek. The vast majority of coalition women we've spoken to, they don't believe that you're sexist or mm. that you have any problem with women. Mm. Many say sometimes the language is just a little clumsy. Yeah, that's fair enough. Jenny would say the same thing. <laughs> I'm sure she would. If my daughters were older, they would probably would too. You know, suburban dads can be a bit clumsy with their language. A spotlight was shone on the parliament. But I think it did cause, uh, you know, as evidenced by the Women's March, a wider type of a reckoning in Australia about how women feel and what we expect. There can be no end to Australia's systemic misogyny in government. This must stop now. Enough is enough. The Prime Minister's office, I think, was surprised that I was going. I was surprised that they were surprised and they sort of said to me, you know, well, why would you go out? You know, you've worked really hard to get elected. Why would you leave the parliament to, to go out to join a protest? It is good and right, Mr Speaker, that so many are able to gather here in this way. Not far from here, such marches, even now, are being met with bullets but not here in this country, Mr Speaker. Not here in this country. 
I remember the comment that he made that we weren't being met with bullets and I think there was a kind of a, a bit of a collective intake of breath from women certainly saying, wow, that's quite the take on that. Oh, that was clumsy, but I think it was, again, completely manipulated and misused and was not my intention to suggest that at all. Quite the contrary. Now, maybe if some other Prime Minister had said that, that's how it would have been taken. But not this Prime Minister. This is a moment that requires leadership, and it requires leadership from this Prime Minister. And we are not getting it, Prime Minister. I think that women had lost faith in us because we didn't handle those situations well. That was the real beginning where Australians stopped listening, but particularly women stopped listening. I think there's, there's no doubt in my mind the issues uh, surrounding women uh, became something very difficult for Morrison to manage uh, from his own office. And then the National Party made it worse by electing a Deputy Prime Minister who was also seen to have a problem with women. So we guaranteed by returning Barnaby Joyce to leadership as a National Party that women would be a big issue at the election campaign, and it, it proved to be so. That's rubbish. You know, as I always said, I said, there are a lot of women who dislike you. I went, don't stop there. There's a lot of blokes who dislike me as well. Today marks one year since the World Health Organization declared the spread of COVID-19 an official pandemic. 12 million Australians are in lockdown this morning with the effects of Sydney's growing COVID outbreak spreading south, forcing Victoria to shut down for the fifth time. When it came to COVID, this was the one episode in, in the second Morrison term that could have saved us. But unfortunately, as it, as it went further, I think it unravelled. The great challenge of the pandemic was this was a period of heavy-handed government which is not instinctive or natural for Liberal and National parties. And, and for that reason, I think it was ultimately very damaging for us politically. And National Cabinet was part of that. We'll get I mean, we did give these premiers uh, uh, big megaphones to use, and they used them. Good morning, Queensland. Well, good afternoon and welcome to South Australia. To the COVID update now. I'm very confident that the Prime Minister has heard our message loud and clear this week and I welcome the changes that were announced. I think he was usurped. You know, the National Cabinet, there is only, there is only one National Cabinet. It's, it's up there in the, in the Parliament House. The Premiers became more important than the Prime Minister in some instances. You had to work with us. You had to work with the Premiers. I don't think and I don't believe that myself or the other premiers were trying to play him. We're all just trying to get the best outcomes and, uh, and save our states and save our people as best we could. Um, I think where the mistakes were made uh, was uh, Scott was too centralist. That was the biggest mistake he made. He was too centralist. He always just had the view that it had to be a one size fits all. The time has come to give Australians their life back. We're getting ready for that, and Australia will be ready for takeoff very soon. I look forward to hearing about that plan. Um, it has not been distributed in any papers to National Cabinet um, prior to National Cabinet's meeting. I, I think partisan interests crept into it in, in 2021, and I saw it as my responsibility to rise above all that. Now, did I pay a political price for that? Yes, I think I did. The National Cabinet process, I think, brought out the best and worst in all of us. My doubts about what made him tick, my uncertainties about exactly who I was dealing with, were only confirmed when time and time again we would make a decision, he would go and announce it, but then he would have his proxies out there criticising the very decisions that we'd made under the banner of a national plan. Daniel Andrews is keeping their doors closed. And more than a thousand jobs are being lost every day on this Premier's watch. The bloody mindedness is unforgivable. 
I would call him out on this. I would ring up, not often, but I would ring up and say, well, what, why is Minister A, B, C, D, Minister F was the worst one, Frydenberg, uh, and he would simply say, oh, well, it's a broad church, and you know, ministers will do what ministers do. Not everything had been done right, but the reason we had lockdowns, a point that was missed by many, the reason we had lockdowns is we didn't have a vaccine. And states weren't in charge of ordering that. That wasn't our job. It was a total shambles. I was seeing on a weekly basis what was happening in the vaccine supply chain world, which showed progressively more and more of the potential supply of vaccines being hoovered up by other countries. And so I was saying to people uh, in government that this was very worrying. And I certainly told uh, Greg Hunt. Every day we were looking to uh, uh, advance things as much as possible, uh, but there was no other vaccine which could have been secured at an earlier time or in a greater volume. The vaccination program done safely, done properly, which is what we're doing here in Australia. It's not a race, it's not a competition. When I heard him first use that term, uh, it's not a race, I actually shouted at the television. I never do that. I was so angry, I can't describe it to you. It was just so wrong. It's not a race, it's not a competition. What did you shout? It was the F word and it was rather loud. <laughs> it's not a race, it's not a competition. I'm not interested in, you know, this state and that state. I'm interested in Australians being vaccinated safely. It was a race. It was always a race. Manifestly, we had longer lockdowns than we actually needed to have because we didn't have uh, supply and rollout as quickly as others. The vaccine rollout in Australia is a shit show and Scotty from marketing has got to take some of the responsibility for it. Do you regret saying the rollout was not a race? I do. Uh, I do. But again, Brendan had been using this phrase quite regularly in our briefings. And that was because, and what it was relating to, was not rushing the science of ensuring the uh, approval of the vaccines was right. See, in a pandemic, no one gets everything right and there will be setbacks. The issue is when those setbacks happen, what do you do then? I've never seen anyone in my whole life work harder than he worked during that pandemic and he didn't sleep and that went on week after week, month after month, in an era of uncertainty. I just thought some days, I don't know how this man is still standing. He was visibly tired and, you know, a bit short occasionally, um, but he was exhausted. And through 21, instead of actually pulling back, he kept you know, a really tight hold on the reins. This is where the multiple, you know, the time the multiple ministries came into play. When did you hear that there was another resources minister? Uh, well, that was uh, in a meeting with the Prime Minister uh, where he said that he'd been uh, sworn into the portfolio, uh, to which my response was to clear the room. In my view, it was a breach of the coalition agreement. The Nationals hold particular portfolios for which they have decision-making authority, and I thought it was a breach of that agreement and not in the, uh, the interest of either the coalition or the nation. Do you think you made the right call on Pepper Levin? Yes. Was it his call, though? It was my call. He's the minister. I had the authority to make the decision and did. We 
put those arrangements in place. It was a decision we took on the run one day, wasn't subject to the same sort of processes. To be honest, it, it drifted from my memory later on because they were just never used. They were never exercised. Um, so, yeah, regrets over that. As of midnight tonight, Victoria will join Sydney under lockdown as the highly infectious Delta variant spreads across state borders. Premier warning the crisis will get worse, with the Delta strain now hitting the northern suburbs. It was in the sort of second half of that year and beyond I needed to be in Canberra, and so I took myself to the lodge. I do not want under 40s to get AstraZeneca. Lieutenant General JJ Fruin in charge of a rollout plagued by supply failures and long delays. And that was a very lonely time. There was multiple times of lockdowns during that period, and so you walk back into a rather empty old house. We were working very closely at the time, and I was normally staying in a hotel when I was in Canberra, and we decided that working together and uh, you know, staying at the lodge would be a practical way to, to get things done. I look, we'd share a meal together, we'd talk, you know, um, watch TV, and uh, we, we talked a lot of shop. <laughs> we, we used to, at dinner, we used to watch, yes, Prime Minister and Yes Minister together. We're both fans from a younger age, and I, I had a pool table in there as well. And so later at night, um, Joshua and I would often play, and our security teams, would, I think, were taking bets on who'd, who'd win, and we'd both have to tell them it to our respective teams the next morning. But there were some light moments in, in amongst that, and the, the fellowship and friendship of, that I had with Josh over that time was, I think, really important to both of us. It's, it, it's sort of a, it's strange, you know, you've got three coalition prime ministers all involved with submarines. Now, Tony decided that we should acquire submarines from Japan, and I inherited this process. By 2016, we had the recommendation, the unequivocal recommendation, to go with France. These would be diesel electric submarines, and that program continued until, of course, it was uh, abruptly and very deceitfully blown up by Morrison in 2021. A show of force never seen before on this scale in the contested South China Sea. The strategic situation with China had changed and was constantly changing, far quicker than I think had been anticipated at the time of when we entered into the diesel submarine contract. And as I continued to look into this matter, my concern was that these subs would be obsolete before they even got wet. And the timetable of when they would come was getting, was moving out. So I was thinking about plan B. The Prime Minister approached me, we had a meeting and said, well, what if? Can we start looking for a plan B? So I said I thought it was a good idea to start looking at, well, you know, what if we could now get access through the Americans and or Brits uh, of nuclear submarine capability? So we started that process you know, very quietly. By this time, I'd morphed it from subs into AUKUS. When I put it to Boris, I remember the day that he was in from hello uh, on this. He loved it, and but he had quite a giggle over the name. And you can imagine what Boris Johnson does with a few permutations of AUKUS. I won't share them. <laughs> no, I won't. Um, but uh, it was... It, it, without Boris, this would have been very difficult to achieve. In my role as ambassador, uh, I was brought in uh, along with a number of naval people here in Washington, D.C. The nuclear navy are 
were sort of skeptical about Australia's capacity to do this at that stage. And the president himself spent a lot of time thinking about this. You know, I've, I've swatted for a few things in my life. Um, I don't know if I've swatted as much for that meeting as any other meeting like I swatted for that meeting. And so, anyway, we sit down and, and the President basically says, you know, I understand you've got something to put to us. Uh, I said, yeah, we do. And I just ran through the whole proposal and, you know, got it right. <laughs> the swatting had paid off. And he was there but had a couple of questions that he was going to have to satisfy, particularly around nuclear non-proliferation. But we had agreed a, a process from that meeting, which was a, the effective yes, subject to let's just dot all the I's and cross all the T's for the next little while. It hadn't landed, though. It hadn't landed yet. And so I still had two horses running. <laughs> well, eventually you have to break the news, don't you, to the French president? Yeah. Tell me about that meeting when you do break the news. We'd agreed to have the dinner in Adelise on the way back from the, the G7. So I came into Paris and their press corps was there for the arrival. Emmanuel kindly welcomes me. Yes, Scott. We are very glad and honoured to have you here in Paris. And I want to tell you how this common history, this common sacrifice means a lot for us. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. I'm sorry Jenny couldn't be here on yeah. this occasion, uh, but uh, she sends her best to, to you. We go in and he was a gracious host. And it's an amazing place to be. He set up the dinner on the back patio. It was a gorgeous summer evening in Paris. It would have been nice to just enjoy it, <laughs> to be honest. And I went, well, that's not on the menu for me tonight. There's important things I need to discuss. So, you know, you have the normal chit-chat around a range of things and eventually I turn the conversation around to what's going on. And I had to be really... I, I couldn't tell him that we had completed agreement because we hadn't. I mean, this thing could all still go pear-shaped. There was no guarantee for us that this was still going to land. You know, we had not taken a decision at that point to cancel a contract. But I was very clear that the situation in China had deteriorated significantly. I said I was concerned about the delays in the project, but appreciative of Emmanuel's direct interventions to try and address those many issues. I said that we were considering other options. I can't tell you what they are. Uh, but obviously, you know, we need a nuclear-powered submarine capability to be able to address these strategic issues. Now, I expected the dinner to end about there. <laughs> it didn't. It went on for some time after, uh, to my puzzlement. But what was interesting is the next day, the French defence system went into hyperdrive. They rang every Australian they could ring. They knew the contract was under threat at that point. There's no doubt in my mind about that. Well, it all has to come to a head, doesn't it? And mm. AUKUS becomes a reality. Mm. You try to call Macron. Yeah, we tried to set up a meeting over the course of that week. And it wasn't happening. So I, I wrote him a letter and I, I texted it to him so I knew he would get it directly. And so he was advised and obviously, you know, you don't cancel a $90 billion contract and the other party's happy. I know exactly what he would have done if I'd told him earlier. He would have deployed the entire French diplomatic corps to Washington and killed the deal. And I wasn't going to let that happen. So, you know, I told him and, and went to bed that night. I didn't get much sleep. <laughs> we were announcing it at 7 o'clock the next morning. That time could not come quick enough. Well, good morning from Australia. Today, we join our nations in a next generation partnership built on a strong foundation of proven trust. The decision came as a terrible shock to France. It was a humiliation for Macron. He was lied to. 
Uh, it caused an enormous rupture uh, in our relations with France. It caused an enormous rupture in America's relations with France. I want to thank uh, that fellow down under. Thank you very much, pal. Appreciate it, Mr. Prime Minister. There's obviously that famous, infamous, mm. however you want to describe it, exchange with Australian reporters, Macron. Yeah. I have a lot of respect for your country. I have a lot of respect and a lot of friendship for your people. I just say when, you, when we have respect, you have to be two and you have to behave in line and consistently with this value. Uh, there was a French election coming up. He wasn't going to, you know, embrace the narrative that we cancelled the contract. You think he lied to you? I don't think. I know. The French president is calling you a liar. I got big shoulders. I'm sure President Xi Jinping called me worst. <laughs> As I said at the time, I think Morrison sacrificed Australian security, sovereignty and honour all at once. It was a terrible, it was the worst decision of his government, in my view. Oh, that's not what history will record it as. It'll record it as the best. And one that others had never sought to successfully undertake. How did you get on with Morrison? Uh, look, I... We weren't enemies, but we just, as I said, it's like we weren't, you know, it was just like we we're in two different circles. And, and, uh, and that was, you know, that, and that's all right. That happens in every schoolyard, doesn't it? Ah, the nationals, we love them. We love a few of them more than others <laughs> in there, some of them more than others. <laughs> Australia needs to achieve net zero emissions as he inches closer to adopting a 2050 target. But the Nationals remain the biggest hurdle in his plan, with one MP saying... It was just six weeks to go now until that big Glasgow conference. The clock is really ticking for the Prime Minister to convince the Nationals to get on board. It was the height of disrespect for the Prime Minister to think he could pack a kilt to Glasgow and not even consult on the second party of government's view on net zero by 2050, to essentially take the Liberal Party's position to Glasgow on behalf of a coalition government. And um, he and I had a very heated uh, exchange about his assumption that we would be accepting of his position. How hard was it to get agreement within your own coalition? Oh, it was extremely difficult. <laughs> it was probably the hardest thing that I had to achieve within the government. And it almost cost, it almost destroyed the government. And I was prepared to bet the entire government on making that commitment. Our plan gets the balance right. Our plan charts a uniquely Australian way. I mean, he had to quite publicly um, put an ultimatum, if you like, to the Nationals that this is the policy of the government. If those of you who are in Cabinet do not agree with the policy of the government, it's your, uh, you're free to resign from the Cabinet. And if the Nationals as a party did not agree with the policy of the government, well, they were also ultimately free to leave the coalition. Um, he had to stand them down. The Nationals are meeting in Canberra this afternoon to try to thrash out a deal on adopting a target of net zero carbon emissions by 2050. I remember it was a Sunday and the National Party was meeting. Things were weighing pretty heavily on me and uh, and the car came to take me to the airport to drive down and the meeting would have been taking place while I was, was in the air. And I said to Jenna that day, well, by the time I land, the government could be over. But it's the right call. And so we got on the plane and then I got a message close to Canberra it's a yes. And I breathed again. <laughs> it 
I mean, it was very close. The Nationals only decided to come on board uh, by uh, two votes. The Coalition's junior partner has won an extra seat in Federal Cabinet, which will tonight sign off on a suite of measures in return for the Nationals backing a carbon neutral economy by 2050. I think there's no doubt that some loud and noisy voices who lost the argument to reposition the party on climate but just could not keep quiet continued to dog us and erode our position towards the electorate. Who are those voices? OK, I'm going to get it out of me. I might as well never speak to the man again. Right, off we go. If Barnaby Joyce could just have kept quiet and actually accepted that he'd lost the debate on climate, it would have been enormously helpful for us because we'd won and he needed to hear that loud and clear. 100% I'm on board with the goal of 2050 zero emissions. What more do you want? I think Morrison understood that his own political mortality was tied to that decision and I think that was handled well. I do think that there were some notable issues with the sale of that policy, though. I mean, when you go around to the booths at the election and every second picture you'd see would be a picture of him hunking a piece of coal in Parliament, may have made the net zero 2050 argument less believable. We've had a decade of drift in climate policy. We've had um, policies proposed and then abandoned. We've had science acknowledged and then ignored. And we've created a situation where more and more assets and more and more Australian lives are at risk from climate change than ever needed to be. I mean, to me, this is the single most irresponsible act that I've ever seen by governments. It was probably only Scott Morrison who uh, would have been able to bring the coalition together around the, the climate targets. I don't think any Prime Minister has had to put as much on the line to achieve that outcome as I did. My predecessors didn't. What one word springs to mind when I say the name Scott Morrison? Faith. What we need to do as Christians is share the love of Jesus. My job, same as yours, love God, love each other. We all love the same job. The great thing about faith is it, it, it takes you out of your present circumstances and puts things into a a rather bigger picture. It helps give you perspective about what's really important. And at the end of the day, that's others. Hello, how are you? Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Come on in. Happy Easter, lots of eggs. <laughs> and it helps you, you know, keep your feet on the ground and, and, and gives you a humble heart, I hope. Well, I... I, I there's a lot of people of faith. You know, I'm, you know, I'm a... Uh, you know, I go to Mass, but I don't believe you should I think it's a private issue. I, I like to know about it at the start. It's good to hear about it. That's great. Got it. Tick that box. Move on. Whereas Morrison let the cameras into the church. Yeah, I don't like that. Uh, it Maybe it's my Catholicism as opposed to Pentecostalism. And for me, it's you in, in conference with the Almighty, but it's not a media event. It's, you know, walk humbly with your God. Actually, we were having a gathering of uh, people. And it was in the Prime Minister's ante room because there were a group of us who used to catch up. And somebody asked me a question about the portfolio, and I said, it's always tough. And whilst I was saying that, Stewie Robert and Scott came over and put their hands on my shoulder and both started to pray. And they took it in turns. And ultimately, what they said in their prayer was, uh, they wanted me to have the strength to do the job, but that I would succeed and would deliver outcomes uh, for Indigenous Australians that would forge a better future. I wasn't uncomfortable. His faith was not an impediment to me. I would regularly pray 
as Prime Minister um, for my colleagues. Uh, and they would pray for me. And we would pray about the, the challenges facing the country. It was just a, a great support network. I mean, yes, it had a, a, a religious faith element to it. There's nothing strange about that. I mean, people do this all the time. I think this is a person who is deeply, um, holds his faith incredibly deeply um, and at a very uh, personal level. And that's where I think uh, the religious discrimination bill uh, was definitely, you know, the Prime Minister's personal passion. People from religious faiths had shared with me, and I, I, I had known it as well, this growing hostility towards their views. We already had anti-discrimination laws that related to, to, to sexuality and, and, and to race and so on. Having religion as one of those seemed to be a, a natural addition. You know, one of the things that I thought was very strange at the beginning of the election year 2022 was that we spent the back end of summer focusing on this religious discrimination bill, uh, which was not a priority in the community. I mean, no one in the community after two years of COVID was saying, geez, we have to have this bill. That's, that's critical. I mean, it was, uh, we were massively out of line with the public in pursuing this and spending all this time. I mean, during all the COVID times, the parliament never sat past nine or 10 o'clock at night, or very rarely. But the only time it sat till 4 a.m. was the religious discrimination bill. That gives you an idea of the way the show was being run. I signalled early that I would be unlikely to support it. It's not OK to be cruel, offensive or humiliating just because you can say it with conviction or point to a religious text to back it up. It became clear to me that it was um, to preference or privilege religious views above others. When this legislation was first discussed, myself and a number of colleagues had made clear to the Prime Minister that we thought the Sex Discrimination Act of 2013, I think it is, which allows schools to discriminate against teachers and students on account of their sexual orientation, gender identity, marital status, pregnancy, all number of things, which are outdated and antiquated, needed to be addressed at the same time as this religious, uh, the broader religious freedom issues. The Prime Minister made a commitment that he would do that, and in fact, he wrote to the opposition leader, Anthony Albanese, in December of 2021, making clear that commitment. When the legislation came forward in late January, early February 2022, that commitment had been dropped. The proposition was that we'd fix the problem for gay children, but leave trans kids behind. To infringe upon one of the most marginalised groups is not just hideous, but also deeply hypocritical. It sent an appalling message, and that was just a proposition that I could not support in all consciousness. I've been a paediatrician my entire life, and I've spent my life caring for children. And so I wasn't going to turn my back on anything that would undermine children in any way whatsoever. I was not happy with that changed position and made my views um, very clear. I did go and speak to the Prime Minister and I explained it was a breach of my own commitment to the electorate on this issue. I mean, I am all for protecting people of faith, but not at the cost of, you know, making already vulnerable people exposed to discrimination. As a psychologist, I couldn't support that. been extensive discussions leading up to that evening and I knew that if two members would across the floor the, the bill would pass and I knew that Trent would vote against the bill. Uh, Bridget uh, had also uh, made it very her position very public so they were two votes that were not going to change. Uh, I'd received undertakings from all the others that they would support the bill that night. He was desperately wanting our support. He called us into a meeting in his office very late, the evening of the vote. He assumed because we were silent in that meeting, there was a level of support, but I could never give my support. And I had expressed that time and time again in party room, 
I don't think you can assume that someone supports something because they're silent. Why were you silent? Because I was really stressed. The pressure put on us to support this suite of legislation related to the Religious Discrimination Act was was very high level stress, very high level stress. Was he ever threatening? It was a very controlling environment in that in that space. I think people were really um, being pressured to change their minds or to hold um, hold with the the government's position. This is a bill that I earnestly hoped would unite this place. But in the early hours of this morning, those hopes were dashed, as five of the Prime Minister's Liberal MPs defied him to join Labor to force changes to religious exemptions already in existing laws. I could not live with myself if I didn't seek to address those issues. How disappointed were you at the time with the actions of those members? Oh, of course I was disappointed. More so with the member for Reid because we had had a, a clear conversation and uh, clearly people changed their view. This bill revealed deep cracks in the government. Scott Morrison hoped for unity and divided his own party, so this is a blow to his authority. The government choosing to shelve the legislation rather than risk further embarrassment. You were singled out as the person the Prime Minister felt particularly betrayed by. How did that manifest itself in the weeks and months to come? Well, I think... ..you know... ..it's tough. But I'm tough. And I got through it. And if I was presented with the same dilemma again, there's no way I wouldn't do it again. I would definitely do it again. There would be a lot of conversation, a lot of talk um, throughout Scott Morrison's leadership about the importance of discipline and unity. But I don't believe that that means coercion and control. I think that there was certainly a desire to maintain control at all times. Some of your colleagues have said, you know, there was a perception of Scott Morrison at this point in the electorate that he was a bully, that he had a problem with the truth. What do you, what do you say to that? Well, I, I think the, the truth and bullying are characteristics, yes, unfortunately. Certain traits of his personality became common knowledge and it was seeping out and it's probably more uh, repugnant when a person who's uh, very religious and church going and you expect a higher degree of integrity and honesty from such a person could not be being truthful uh, or not being willing to listen and uh, you know, what many of us might think, you know, have more of the Christian philosophy virtues. down to sort of D-Day with the 22 election, mm. you're approached by some colleagues. Who were they? What did they want? Well, I was approached by colleagues late in 21 and again in early 22 about potentially challenging for the Prime Ministership. Getting close to the election, I could see we were in all sorts of strife. And I just said to Josh, I said to Josh, mate, maybe it's time you, you, you tapped him on the shoulder. I said, I think you've got the support there behind it to make it happen. 
I said to him, your leadership would give stability to the party given the dissension that's now starting to arise within the party. Would you put your hand up? It's not something that I was interested in doing. We had seen a revolving door of Prime Ministers on both the Liberal and the Labor side. And it was time to bring that to an end, to have one Prime Minister from the start of the term to the end of the term. And Scott Morrison was that. And so I made a decision personally that being loyal to the leader was important to the stability and to the effectiveness of the government. Did you tell the Prime Minister about these approaches? And if so, what, what did he say in response? Well, he knew that some of the colleagues were unsettled. Were you ever worried at that point that your leadership was under threat? Never. Never. Josh, you know, I never doubted him for a moment. And I had very good cause not to doubt him, as history shows. Oh, well, I think Josh did the right thing, but I think Josh didn't have the numbers either, so uh, I think that was a pretty clear uh, position. Um, I, I just don't think there was the will to do it. And, and there was also a view, by the way, an important view, that Scott had done a good job through the pandemic under incredibly difficult circumstances. Certainly, Josh paid a high price himself for his loyalty. My name is Monique Ryan, and it is my great pleasure and privilege to be your independent for Kuyong. The Teals are running a candidate in your seat, and mm. this is this movement that's developed. What are your initial thoughts about that at the time? Well, again, this was a broader um, effort to run in seats that were either metropolitan seats or were seen as being held by moderate Liberals. Uh, and the Teals defined the issues in which they would contest those seats, climate change, integrity and women. Well, good morning, everyone. Earlier today, I visited His Excellency the Governor-General and advised him uh, to call an election for the House of Representatives and half of the Senate on May 21. One of the unique uh, things to come out of um, our focus group research during COVID was uh, the value of empathy. And the value of empathy um, suddenly became fashionable. Going to Hawaii when half of Australia was burning was a mistake. I don't hold a hose, mate. And Labor very cleverly sort of seized on that. That's not my job. That's not my job. It's not my job to do that. It reinforced this prejudice that he lacked empathy. I will seek to empathise a lot more, but I tell you what, at the end of the day, what matters most is I get the job done. And they made it a personality contest rather than a policy contest. And in a personality contest, Albanese was always going to beat Morrison. My experience comes from the Maracle Red Devils and the New Down Swans, all my son's sporting teams. There was a sentiment against the Prime Minister which became a massive weight on all of us and it was like having a 10,000 tonne boulder attached to your leg. No matter how hard you pedal and tried, you were being dragged down with, um, with, with the gravitational force. <laughs> What did the captain's pick of Catherine Deeve say to you? <laughs> uh, um... Please welcome our fabulous candidates for this election. Catherine Deeves, one of the most controversial figures of this electorate, thanks to some of the comments that she has made about gender reassignment surgery and trans people during this debate. How good? things you're saying about gender reassignment surgery for teenagers was mutilation. When you look at medical negligence cases, that is the terminology that they use. Do you think that Catherine Deves's views, particularly on transgender children, didn't suit a modern Liberal Party? Catherine's views, particularly on transgender issues in sport, 
I think, are widely supported, and I support them. Um, she'd made some other comments uh, on social media and other things, which were quite um, excessive, and she'd walk some of those back. Uh, were we searching for female candidates and candidates that represented broad diversity? Yes. And did I want in New South Wales candidates with broad diversity? Yes. Were there other choices? Yes. Would I have preferred them? Yes. You know, the Dave's pick was a frolic in the end. It, it ended up being a huge distraction. Um, you know, she didn't make any headway in Warringah, but it certainly caused some of her can candidates in neighbouring seats, uh, including myself, a high degree of damage. As for who will be the next Prime Minister, John Howard admits it's too close to call. I find this election very hard to pick. Australia will decide on Saturday, May 21. I think the biggest single weakness in the Coalition's campaign was that we had no economic plan for the future. People weren't shouting, we want Albo. They weren't. They stumbled into a change of government because we offered them nothing for the future. I don't agree with that, and I've told John that. And I can only put it down to not being familiar with the details of our policy position. What were your constituents, people generally, telling you about what they were now thinking about Morrison in 2022 in that campaign? Something I heard quite commonly, and I wasn't alone here, would be... Fiona, we really like you. You know, you're great, Katie. Look, Dave, we like you. We think you've done a good job. But we don't want to vote for your leader. We don't like your Prime Minister. I'm sorry, I cannot vote for you. Trent, we want to vote for you, but we just can't vote for you knowing that that keeps Scott Morrison in the lodge because voting for you will be a vote for Scott Morrison. Certainly sitting here looking at the figures and uh, looking at those losses that are coming through, uh, the losses are, I think, significant. Tim Wilson's seat, down a whopping 12.1%. Josh Frydenberg looks like he's still in quite a lot of trouble. Trent Zimmerman's seat, 13.4% plunge. Because of those independents, it's very difficult to see how the coalition can get to a majority position. I have spoken to the Leader of the Opposition and the incoming Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, and I've congratulated him on his election victory this evening. Do you mind if I come back to that? After the election result, you're obviously disappointed, uh, having thrown everything into it for that period of time and, and, and to have been defeated. But as I look back, I have nothing but thanks for the opportunity. I mean, there are things you might have done differently. And, you know, I'll continue to reflect on it. But I think one of the things as a leader, I could have done a lot better was having started well connecting with Australians as Prime Minister. Um, that, that emotional connection between me and many Australians was, was lost. And I do regret that. Because I think, from my point of view, the connection is, is just as strong. So it was about three months after the election and I remember waking up on a Saturday morning, opening the Weekend Australian and it was a relatively small piece beginning on the front page about the fact that Scott Morrison had taken multiple ministries of his colleagues in Cabinet without informing them. I was deeply shocked. In fact, I texted one of the ministers involved and said WTF and, and, and he responded in similar terms. I was livid. To me, that's crossing a line. I was gobsmacked, as I think most of us were, and it was, it was just stupid. It's completely surreal to me. Could not make it up. 
Well, I was surprised. I still don't know why it happened, but I made it clear I didn't agree with the decision. If it warrants you taking over their job, it warrants you taking to Cabinet and saying, we're going to have a discussion, I believe that I should be the Minister of Five Portfolios. Now, that would be an interesting day in Cabinet. <laughs> and probably a very bad career move. But if you believe in it so strongly, be transparent about it. Well, I was extremely disappointed, and particularly that it wasn't made transparent to me and to, to others. I thought it was unnecessary. I thought it was an example of extreme overreach. You know, I apologise to Josh, and we've, you know, we're reconnected and uh, as good of friends as you could hope for. Um, and, and that's where we sit. It was, it was regrettable. And uh, so he, he knows I'm sorry about that. How did it damage your relationship with him when you heard about this? It impacted that relationship and still does to this day. Did I think he should resign? You bet I did. Because he trashed what I believed the Liberal Party stood for. And whilst he stayed in Parliament, we would never, ever be able to disassociate ourselves from that issue. It would always be Scott Morrison and the five ministries. I don't share that view. Only he can speak to what was going on in his head when he made those decisions. But it's a bit sad in some ways that the, the multiple ministry staff and all of that runs the risk of people completely forgetting that on many things he did a good job. Um, some people would be shocked to hear me say that, but they forget that JobKeeper was incredibly important. They forget that uh, even though the vaccines took too long, we did get to one of the highest double dose rates anywhere in the world. There's a risk that I think that all just gets washed uh, that just gets washed away, uh, and that's a bit sad. I'd hate for people to look back on the last nine years and think it was all about leadership rivalry, revenge, factional warfare, Liberals versus National Party, turf wars. It was actually an incredibly successful government led by three very different men. Looking back on the nine years, we let toxicity through leadership battles affect our competence. This is my leader. There you go. And I'm ambitious for him. There was deep enmity and personal ambition at play, and it characterised those years in government. I think that what we have all learnt is that there needs to be honesty and integrity in politics. What a day for love, for equality, Australia has done it. Probably the biggest lesson the Liberal Party should take out of those nine years is to remember that politics is not an end in itself and to focus on the people, you know, the country, the national interest. Once you leave the office of Prime Minister, you've had your go. Whatever you wanted to do, that was the time to do it. So I'm not about to provide a commentary on what others should have done when they were there in times past or what those in the future should be doing when they're there. Losing is devastating. Uh, opposition is awful. But in terms of the big lessons, every single second, every minute, every hour, every day, you've got to maximise what you're doing. Because eventually, the circus comes to an end. They're good? OK. Good. All right, thank you very much. <coughs> I'm exhausted. All righty. Thank you. Pleasure. Thanks for that. Good luck with it all. Have you got some colourful language from other people? <laughs> we do a bit, yeah. Well, that's good. Hopefully you don't need to use any of that. No, I think that I'm going to quit while I'm ahead. I'm not sure I'm ahead. I might, not be, I might be, uh, never be able to show my face in the Liberal Party, but that's all right. Thank you. Thank you.